Good afternoon. My name is James K. Holder II. Some of you may know me as Sir James II. And I'd like to welcome you back to Not On My Watch. Um, as always, I'd like to ask you to subscribe, like, comment, and share. I want you to retweet this and repeat this. Um, if you're watching, today is uh, April, it's Wednesday, April 12th, uh, 2017. And this episode is dedicated to Karen Elaine Smith and Jonathan Martinez. These are two victims um, of a domestic violence dispute um, in San Bernardino, California that occurred this week. And the reason why I want to dedicate this episode is not, you know, this type of thing happens so frequently that it's almost, um, it, it is demoralizing and it's dis disheartening. There are, my heart breaks for this scene because not only do we have the life extinguished of a woman who just is a newlywed, who was uh, killed by her husband at her place of work teaching children. We also have a young child at the age of eight years old who lost his life in the balance of this. And what's, I, not even to politicize this, but we have to acknowledge that the culture in this country when we have uh, a Betsy DeVos in place who believes that schools should be op have open access to guns, that you need to have guns on campuses to protect from grizzly bears. When you have no sense of commitment to the children's protection and safety that could have prevented um, an occurrence like this. When you have a House and a Senate that within weeks past, within the past weeks, passed legislation that made it easier for mentally ill people to acquire guns in this country. When you have a veteran with a history of uh, domestic violence abuse with a gun showing up to the place of business of his estranged what newly wed but was soon to be divorced I guess they were separated uh, wife having such unfettered access to her um, no metal detectors no protection something's wrong in this country and we have to take responsibility for that um, a lot has gone on this week. That is one of those stories that has not gotten the attention in all the white noise and the mayhem of Trump's uh, missile, uh, uh, missile launching on that, that didn't do anything in Syria. That, that didn't take out any runways, didn't take out any uh, refueling centers, didn't really damage any planes. Um, we, we know that that was sort of one of those publicity stunts that Trump is known for. This morning, um, there was another, you know, where Sean Spicer, who I want to I not believe that Sean Spicer is inept. I want to think that Sean Spicer's job is to, is to create these diversions. Um, of, of saying just asinine comments that, you know, he's trying, he says that even Adolf Hitler, it's Passover now, even Adolf Hitler didn't, uh, didn't resort to uh, chemical warfare on his people. And then he has a clarifying statement that's even worse. And then another clarifying statement for that clarification. And then, I mean, it's just really these blunderous, anything you can do 
to take away from the, uh, the, the real prize which is at stake, which is the Trump-Russia collusion. Which really, if nothing else, all of the things that you've seen over the last few days within the Trump administration, within the White House, within comments from Ivanka and Eric Trump, uh, you've seen all of these things that have really, really pointed more attention towards um, this clear and unequivocal position that many have that Trump colluded with the Russian government. We know that um, Trump, the White House warned uh, Russia about the attacks on the Syrian airfield. We know that Russia then contacted Assad and that and and Syrians and, and that protections were set up so that our assault, our missile strike that cost eighty eight million dollars in taxpayer dollars, um, was virtually ineffective. We know that that was that was orchestrated on that side. Now, why did Sean Spicer even bring up Adolf Hitler? Was he trying to justify Trump's actions? Was he trying to justify, was he trying to sort of make Trump seem as though he was this champion of the people, that, that this soup, this savior for um, freedom and, and people's rights? Is anyone gullible enough to believe that at this point? We have a man who has a White House strategist, still a White House strategist, in uh, Bannon, who is a, a, a rabid anti-Semite. We know this. We know that this White House is poised to, one, discredit, uh, revise the history around uh, the Holocaust, the suffering of Jewish um, people and throughout history, not even just Jewish Americans, but just Jewish, the Jewish faith. We've seen them on a continual assault. And Sean Spicer is just one of these people who've taken, uh, taken a knee for, for the White House. And we have to, we, we have to resist the urge to consider these things um, distractions. Because the reality is, it's our responsibility as Americans to stand up for each other. Um, there's a lot of foolishness going around, and I wanted to sort of take a different approach today and, and focus a little bit on the positive. Um, I wanted to, to bring up a, a letter, a, a quote. Uh, this is actually from the Bible, um, and it is from the New Testament, uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. Uh, this is chapter 6, verse 2. It says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What we have to do is understand that empathy is and should be our law. Over the past weeks, you know, we've seen this thing in San Bernardino. We see the comments from Sean Spicer and the White House. We see the missile strikes in Syria that are, that are in tandem with the White House's posturing against um, the people of Syria and the children of Syria and the women of Syria who... We are not willing to let people in. We're not willing to provide a safe haven for these people. And yet, we want to pretend um, through the Trump White House that this missile strike is in defense of, of the Syrian people. And I, and I call bullshit. It's, it's just, it's ridiculous at this point, And we need to be really serious about standing up for each other. The other day, this is Sunday night going into Monday. Um, we had this incident on a United Airlines flight where this 69-year-old doctor of Asian heritage um, is forcibly dragged off of a plane where he paid, paid for his seat, paid to be able to get to his destination safely. And though the consideration that he deserved, that he earned, um, as a customer, was just disregarded by this company. You had statements from United Airlines that just sort of threw out, it just was kind of, again, statement after statement of just recklessness that just showed no empathy, no care, no concern for this person's well-being, no concern for this person's right to exist, and you know, I was sort of disappointed in the reaction of the people on the plane. Some people recorded it. 
Um, no one really, no one really stood up in defense of this person. Um, but I was excited to see that you know there has been enough coverage of this event to get uh, serious financial ramifications on United Airlines to the point where you know they've lost easily over a billion dollars in, in value of their company due to just their stock plummeting um, after this incident within the last 36 hours. You see, similarly, uh, with the resistance, we've talked about Bill O'Reilly. Now, Bill O'Reilly is connected to the story because when it aired on his show, he's chuckling about it. He's laughing about it. He's taking this defense of um, United Airlines, and no one should condemn United Airlines for this. But where is the protection for American citizens? Where is the protection for consumers? This administration has set a trajectory within the culture of this country to disregard human life, to disregard us. And it really started out, um, it started out as an onslaught against uh, Mexican Mexican immigrants. It started out as an onslaught against people of color, against uh, Hispanic Americans. And then there were some things against black people. And then later it became about assaults against Native Americans. And this is kind of like one of those key things where we've seen, we knew that all the anti-Semitic culture was there with Bannon and all this other stuff, but you've seen it over and over again. This administration picks key dates. They pick Passover to then discuss how Hitler didn't use chemical warfare against his people. I don't know about all those millions of Holocaust victims who were gassed by Adolf Hitler um, in the concentration camps, as Sean Speicher likes to refer to them as uh, Holocaust centers, the revisionism is white supremacy. It plays along that line of racism, and we've talked about this on this show. We have to take up each other's burdens. We have to live united as Americans. And I hate to use the term united because clearly... But that, that, that is our challenge. That is what the resistance is. Every week when this show closes out, I ask you to relax, relate, and resist. And so this episode is particularly focused on those three things. Um, the resistance is relating. The resistance is sometimes relaxing. And with spring ahead and, you know, spring and spring cleaning and clear out a new energy, there are things that are just going to happen in this country. Uh, there are things that we're not going to be able to control. Last night, we witnessed that um, uh, it wasn't a hotly contested race in Kansas. I believe this was the 4th District of Kansas. Uh, There was a a race for a congressional seat. And the, the GOP nominee won, but narrowly. You know, like, we're talking about Kansas here. A Democrat really was not in a position to win this seat. Now, some would argue that if enough energy had been put behind it, um, then this this candidate from the uh, the Democrats could have won. But you know, if ifs and nuts were candy and butts, if ifs and butts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas, right? You could say what would happen now, but the, really, what we need to do, what we are called to do now, is focus on flipping the six. Now, I have been one that has been skeptical about John Ostoff's capability of flipping the sixth in Georgia, but this is a race I believe that we can win. Showing the close margin in Kansas, um, and with the, the the challenge that we're faced with now is that there is confusion with Trump. Uh, Trump's sort of reposturing on Syria. You know, some people are dissuaded and distracted by his uh, missile strikes in Syria. And so some are sort of easing up to this idea of a President Trump. That's one of those things that you do uh, if you're about to skirt off to Mar-a-Lago for another 11th consecutive weekend since you've been president. You might send a few million, $88 million in missiles to, from a company that you own stock in that whose stock rose after you sent that attack that rendered really no result in terms of what we would expect uh, as Americans. But all that's neither here nor there. This is probably one of the more challenging episodes that I've had to do because 
I'm, I'm so just sort of, I'm perplexed by where we find ourselves. Um, I want to talk about Bill O'Reilly and the fact that after today, he might no longer be on the air. Um, Bill O'Reilly is falling in line with what we've seen with United Airlines, right? You have this lack of concern, someone who couldn't care less. Um, the CEO of United issued, again, statement after statement, just not caring about this man, uh, this doctor of 69 years old who was dragged off this plane, um, who feared for his life. No one should ever have to suffer through that. Um, but Bill O'Reilly just laughs about it. Two weeks ago, he was talking about the face of the resistance, Maxine Waters, Representative Maxine Waters. Hey, Auntie Maxine. Um, talked about her, and we talked about it on the show. And, you know, this sort of started this whole relitigation of claims against Bill O'Reilly. And so it, it's been one of those things he hasn't been able to escape. Now, he did lose a significant amount of support with uh, the, uh, the commercial backers for his show, much like you've seen in the loss of support for the stocks of um, United Airlines. And when you follow the money, you realize that that's what it's about with many of these cases. You have Bill O'Reilly, who is now on uh, indefinite vacation, right? Uh, he came on the air yesterday and said that he was on vacation until, I believe, April 24th. And we'll see if he's ever going to return. Hopefully, you know, this might be the end of him because he's somewhat toxic. He, one, had this sexist and racist assault on a beloved figure within American politics, Maxine Waters. And then, as a result, it, it really, again, brought back up this, this pattern that he has against women. And uh, with the sexual assault allegations and everything else, a lot of sponsors just said, you know what, we can't support this. Um, and so you have a situation where there is progress with the resistance. When we take up each other's burdens, when we make a stand, you saw it with Pepsi, you saw it with United, you saw it with Bill O'Reilly. When we each, within this movement within this progressive coalition of women and LGBT and people of color and even and even straight white Christian men of means with access to education. We can all choose to really give a damn about each other and really pitch us think about things that happen. And as a result, when we use our dollar in conjunction with our votes, we can make, we can affect the change that we want to see in our country. We can form this, this, this more perfect union that we want to see on non-election years by focusing with our economics. We could say, okay, you know, we're not going to contribute to these sources. We're not going to support if you, if you support these things. And so hopefully some of the successes for the resistance have been, we might see the end to sexist and racist projections from Bill O'Reilly. We might see airlines like United focus a bit more on the protection of people of color and customers. Um, this isn't Montgomery anymore. Like this is not the Montgomery bus boycott. This is a, an airline. We expect different and better in 2017. And we're going to get that. Unfortunately, we have three defunct branches of government um, that would allow for the confirmation of Neil Gorsuch to be to serve in the highest court and that happened this week and this is something that we sort of knew was going to happen we knew that um, Mitch McConnell was going to you know elect to evoke the the nuclear option and in, in, in uh, appointing this man unqualified to the task uh, to serve in our highest court, uh, despite all of the Russia uh, allegations against uh, President Trump, despite the plagiarism claims against him, despite this, all of the other problems with this candidate, and despite the fact that he didn't get the requisite 60 votes um, within the Senate, that he was still confirmed, means that we, we, we already have 
a House and Senate that cower to our illegitimate president, and now we have a, a right-leaning SCOTUS that effectively all cowers to this illegitimate president who was, who was a Putin puppet. It's disheartening, but we got to keep going and we got to keep our eyes on the ball. The Trump and Russia collusion, we are seeing the unraveling. It may be a year, it may be, it may be a few months, it may, who knows where that's going to lead us. But we have to remain focused. And if we can focus on each other, focus on protecting each other. Stop telling each other that, oh, that, oh, that, that Holocaust remark was just, a, that was just a distraction. It's not a distraction if you're Jewish. If someone says that the, the greatest onslaught against your people didn't happen. That's just not a headline to you. That is your real life. When Ben Carson, of all people, said that slaves came over in search of a better life, that was, a, that was an unprecedented attack against the African American community. And this revisionism needs to be taken seriously from all of us. It is not okay to tell each other that, oh, well, that's not important, we need to focus on this. I'm so sick of people telling me, uh, people on the left, saying, oh, well, don't focus on all this, this, this stuff from, you know, the, the alt-left. We need to work together. You can't really work with people who are denying that your pain exists. And so with the call for empathy, what I want us to do is to be reminded of two people's, th two people's uh, words. The first is the words of Anne Frank. She says here, I don't think of all of the misery, but of all the beauty that still remains. There is so much more that unites us than divides us. And we have to remain focused on that. We can't really um, build a coalition if we're not, uh, if we don't coalesce to each other's needs, to each other's demands, to each other's fears. And we have to be willing to listen to those things. Along with that, Again, I'm reminded of the words of Dr. Maya Angelou. Um, prejudice is a burden that confuses the past, threatens the future, and renders the present inaccessible. We must be willing to accept each other's pain. We got to do it. Every week I call you here and I say, relax, relate, and resist. And it started out as a joke based on <laughs> this fabulous character of Debbie Allen from uh, A Different World. But it really does. It, 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 is, it is a thing. Sometimes you can't control what's going on within the White House. And that brings me to Sean Spicer. While our economics can determine the placement of a Bill O'Reilly, because you can get rid of his ad dollars and he can just go away, because now Fox News doesn't want to be tied to this toxic person when it comes to ad dollars. You can, you know, refuse to buy a ticket on United and it can plummet their stock and, and everybody can kind of bail and they can lose close to $2 billion in stock value within a few days. That's all great. Elections present a singular opportunity for us to determine our governance. And people like Sean Spicer, people like Betsy DeVos, who, you know, just continually revise history, people like... Uh, ben Carson, who continually revise our history, uh, and this is all of our history, you know, the Holocaust is, it is history that we should all be able to learn from. Slavery and Jim Crow is history in America that we should all be able to learn from. Um, the fact that Anne Frank was denied entry to the United States, we should all be remorseful of that. We should all be regretful of that. This, this posturing that we have as a nation when we voted um, to elect Donald Trump as opposed to Hillary Clinton, who, again, letting Syrian refugees in, not letting them in. This should have been a lesson that we knew better than from, from World War II. We should have learned this scores ago. And it didn't happen. So now we have to be continually reminded of each other's pain. And I say keep talking about it. If you are in one of these marginalized communities, let your voice be heard. And if you're not in a marginalized community, or if you're within a different marginalized, mar marginalized community, ask about other people's experiences. Try to find out about your neighbors. That's been my experiences over the last few weeks. And briefly, I just, 
I had the most monumental, beautiful, joyous occasion this week. Um, two of my neighbors, very close friends of mine now, um, Molly and Julian, they are a white couple from California. And you know, sometimes I don't always get along with the super progressives, but these are my friends now. And we had this cookout. And this cookout was my vision for America. Um, some of my friends came, some of my neighbors came, many of their friends came. We all came together over food, over conversations about our shared experiences in Atlanta. We learned, we talked about our experiences, our pain. We talked about the future, what we look forward to. We talked about our careers. We talked about food. We ate a lot of food. And we just shared in each other's lives. We shared in each other's experiences without judgment. Um, everybody was there because there was, you know, alcohol. So it was just one of those things where we were able to connect and we were able to learn from each other. And we didn't always, we didn't all agree on everything. There were Jewish people there. There were Christian people there. There were atheists, agnostics. There were Muslims there. There was, there, everybody was represented. And it wasn't even a deliberate thing. It was just, this is the culture that we have chosen to accept. Some aspects of it were a little bit uncomfortable. At some points, I was the only black person there. But we have to be able to make it, accept each other for, um, within our own community. We've got to be able to realize that we're all here and we all, we all belong here. And when you are willing to sacrifice a little bit of your ego, sacrifice a little bit of your comfort to connect with somebody, that's when you can start to build that coalition. So that's what I just, within the spirit of, of the, we're past the equinox, <laughs> we're, we're, our shorter days are behind us, right? Use the, the, the sunlight, use the joy, use this replenishing um, as an opportunity to get to know your neighbors and, and reconnect and hopefully rebuild. You know, we have an opportunity next in six days to flip the sixth. If John Ossoff gets 50% of the vote, we could put this whole thing behind us. The resistance will have proven to have been strong, will have proven to be connected, and we will send a message that hate will not win in this country. And that's what I want to leave everyone with. Um, with that, I want to go on to the next segment of the show, um, which is Ask James. Uh, I always want to invite you to just send questions to at JKH2 via DM or um, at Not On My Watch TV. And these are both on Twitter. You can just DM me any question. I will try to answer them on the show. Sometimes I can't get to all the questions. So today I'm just going to do one. And this one says, uh, my county... Democrats groups have very few black Latino members. I'm on the community outreach committee. <laughs> Do you have any advice for reaching out to communities who are rightfully leery of white people approaching them? Apparently this, this question is uh, from a white person. Um, approaching them. Thanks for your voice. I've learned a lot from you. Thank you. Um, I think what you have to do is create a space for the conversation. I think start with start with who you know. If you're if you're white and you're sort of reluctant and you're on an outreach committee for some reason with no black people on it, maybe one, try to offer an opportunity to get black people on your community. Uh, maybe on your committee. That would be sort of my first start. If you know anybody who's just any somewhat active Within your, within your area, and it doesn't have to be within your particular district, but just someone that you know, reach out. See if you can get someone to sort of uh, join along with you, and that might help if you're doing anything door-to-door, -door, canvassing, making phone calls. Those shared experiences are invaluable because even if it's, even if it's not just that superficial experience, sometimes you just learn things through osmosis of spending time with people from other communities that help you relate to people from those communities. So that would be my first advice. Uh, my second advice would be when you have events, um, one, make sure that you're reaching out, like that you're letting people know in other communities, in other parts of town that, that you know, where there might be a little higher concentration of people of color. Try to make sure that those people know about the event. And then from there, give them an opportunity to show up. And when they show up, give them an opportunity to be heard. Don't just 
have them there for the numbers. Don't just have them there to say that they're these token people who, you know, showed up to support you. No, let them show up so you can show that you're going to support them. Because at the end of the day, if we're talking about a progressive coalition, we have to have a safe space and a forum for people to feel as though they can communicate, for people to feel as though they're going to be able to show up in an environment that might be a little uncomfortable for them, but that is gonna ultimately be welcoming. And, and, and what you have to do is really convince people of color that you might not know uh, directly, that they're gonna feel as though you're gonna be receptive to them. And so what is in your message that's, that's allowing that to happen? It doesn't mean when you have a flyer, you have a bunch of black people on this flyer. I think that's very, uh, very shallow and trans you know, it's something that people really see through, but you have to be able to show, demonstrate that you really care and that you're really open to listening to people of other communities. And um, there's a lot of ways you can do that, but it starts with sort of understanding and, and asking questions. So I think that's a, you're off to a good start, but just um, don't force it, you know? Uh, just create a safe space. That would be my, my best advice. And if you have people who aren't necessarily used to communicating with people of color, try to keep them at bay a little bit. Because sometimes you have these intense personalities uh, who, not that they have ill will or, or mean any harm, but just sometimes you have people in louder voices that are, are so ready to respond and not listen. And so you have to be able to sort of create, again, focus on creating that safe space. Um, with that, please continue to send your questions to um, Ask James. I mean, I, I send it to at JKH2 at Twitter or um, at Not On My Watch TV um, via Twitter. And I will, I'll probably do at some point, I'm gonna, I do 22 episodes episodes per season there's two seasons per year and I take about eight weeks off per year all of this is pretty new so at some point I will do sort of like a an Ask James an all Ask James segment episode and you can look forward to that in the future um, I want to thank our friends of the show uh, Jared O from Washington DC I'd like to thank Gina H from Aloha Oregon Aloha Gina H and Gabrielle D from Lauder Hill, Florida. And um, of course, uh, what we do here is just, you know, there's no advertising, there's no anything. This is all a self-funded production. Um, and if you donate a dollar via paypal.me slash jkh2, it will help me buy a cup of coffee. If you donate more than a dollar, it will help me more buy more than one cup of coffee. So I invite you to do that as well. Um, this has been one hell of a week. And I don't anticipate that it's going to get any easier. But if we work together, we might make it a little more bearable for each other. So as always, I want you to focus on relaxing, relating, and resisting. Until next time. Too complicated.